Our guest is Mona Altahawi, author of Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. This book expands upon her widely popular and controversial 2012 foreign policy essay on Middle Eastern gender relations, in which she asked, why do they hate us? Now, please note, if you think they and us refer to Muslims and Americans, you'd be wrong. They are the Arab men and the us she refers to are Arab women. From the response this article received, there is no denying that misogyny in the Arab world is an explosive issue and continues to be so. Interviewing Mona will be Noreen Chowdhury Fink, head of research and analysis at the Global Center on Cooperative Security. She is an expert on violent extremism, including how it relates to women. Thank you all of you for joining us here today and of course thank you for Mona for being here and for this fantastic book. It's been a difficult but, but really, really fascinating read and I'm going to jump right into one of the key questions that came to my mind as you were describing how women sort of fought alongside men for the revolutions and how the Arab Spring was as much a citizen uprising that included both men and women. But you asked the really potent question then whose revolution? And, and what did women get out of the Arab Spring? Are they better off now? Right. Well, I mean, undoubtedly, this re the revolutions that began with Tunisia in 2010 were not revolutions about gender or uh, women's equality or women's liberation. They were revolutions that were driven by an insistence that people wanted to be free and wanted to lead dignified lives. And you could see that from the chants that you got on the streets. People were chanting bread, freedom, uh, social justice, and human dignity. And you could hear these chants across the various countries where the uprisings and revolutions took place. But, but what drew people on the street was a recognition that the state oppressed everybody, men and women. And you saw men and women side by side. But the, the points that I'm trying to raise in my book are what happened when women went home and what did they realize about the kind of oppression that they as women had to face. And that's where I draw this, what I call the trifecta. And the trifecta is basically the recognition that the state, the street, and the home together oppress women specifically. So, and that's where the double revolution, what I call the double revolution, the social and sexual revolution comes in. Because we began a political revolution that was directed towards the state. But unless we have the social sexual revolution that takes the fight to the street and the home as well, in an attempt to destroy the patriarchy of that trifecta, then clearly it's only the men's revolution. And you see that playing out in so many of the countries, but specifically my own country, where I moved back in 2013, Egypt. All we've done is play this, basically, a political musical chairs, where we got rid of Mubarak, then we got a military junta of 19 Mubaraks, then we got Mohamed Morsi, then we got Sisi, and it's just one man replacing another. So unless we, we take that revolution to the streets and to the home with gender at its heart and have that social sexual revolution, the political revolution, as far as I'm concerned, will fail because it will always be men's revolution. So you're, you're painting this picture of a quest for freedom, a quest for equality, a quest for rights, and you're sort of complicating this image we have of the Middle East with the men and women fighting side by side, but then this continued revolution of women. Certainly in our line of work, working on countering violent extremism and counterterrorism, we're faced with another very puzzling image, which is of young women then leaving homes presumably in the West, where they do have some of these rights, where they're at least legally protected, and then going to join perhaps the most extreme of some of these misogynist movements in, in ISIL, in Iraq, and Syria. So how do you square that image between the sort of desire for freedom and the sexual revolution you're talking about, and then young women choosing to leave places where they might, you know, should have some of those rights, and then going to join ISIL? Those pictures are very puzzling put together. Right. Too often when we look at the Middle East and North Africa, the only options that we see available for people are either military rule or Islamic rule, as if that, that's the only thing available, as if a country like Egypt of you know, 85 million to 90 million people, that's the only thing we could come up with. I, I think that the, we have to place Daesh along the spectrum of that political Islam that I'm also fighting. I'm, I'm fighting military rule and political Islam because I think they're two sides of the same coin, authoritarianism, paternalistic rule, and this very misogynistic approach 
to life and religion. And I think that Daesh belongs to the, the, the far right extreme. In my book, I mentioned Daesh is one of the many groups that are, that are killing and maiming people in Syria and Iraq. And they specifically target women. But mo most of my focus is on the Salafi groups and the Muslim Brotherhood in the region. But if I were to take my arguments from the book and, and ex extend them to the UK and parts of Europe, and in some instances here in the US, I think what those women represent are the more extreme version of the women of the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi groups who, in my opinion, have internalized this misogyny, who have, have basically understood that to survive in the kind of culture that we live in, there are certain things that you have to learn and regurgitate back, and in that, in that case be, be protected and comforted by that group. So for, um, when it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, we had women who were advisors to Mohammed Morsi and who were the, the heads of the women's committee of the Muslim Brotherhood who made outrageous statements such as female genital mutilation is a form of beautification. Women should not protest because it's undignified. This in the middle of the revolution, we had the, the head of the women's committee of the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party actually saying it's undignified for women to protest. They should let their brothers and fathers protest. So if I were to, to draw that line to those women who go and join Daesh, what I would say is, I, I would also complicate it by this idea, you know, this idea of choice feminism that we often talk about now. I'm often asked when it comes to the veil and various veils, why are you so opposed to the veil? A woman has chosen to do this. And this idea of choice has to be complicated beyond a woman has chosen to do this. Just because a woman has chosen to do something does not oblige me as a woman to support that choice. Because unless that choice is a feminist choice, this is where we part ways. So these young women who go and join Daesh, in, in my opinion, they are not making feminist choices. They are, they are committing what I believe is as, as egregious as the women who joined the Charles Manson gang. So it is very puzzling to me. I do not support that choice. And I think it's an internalization of a very dangerous kind of misogyny. It's moving into this idea that women have to some extent internalized this message so much that they become the main protagonists. You know, you talk about the mothers who take their daughters to be sort of mutilated or mothers who, who agree in this. So let's complicate the notion of what it means to be an Islam and, uh, you know, oh, a woman in Islam. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about the Aisha Khadija complex. There's this enormous focus on the youngest wife of the Prophet and, and what you know, she did and that relationship. There's very little discussion about Khadija, who was to all intents and purposes his boss. She was older. She was his only wife as long as she was alive. And she proposed to him. Yes. Why are we not talking more about Khadija? And why aren't women abroad in the diaspora communities? And, and these girls that you're saying have this very simplified notion why is Khadija not more the role model than... Right. And, you know, Aisha may have been a good role model. I don't, I don't want to say no. Right, right. But why aren't we talking more about Khadija? You know, this, this thing about Khadija is really interesting to me because Khadija, many of you might know, was the first person who accepted Muhammad's message. She was the first person who believed in him. And this is a woman who, as you said, was 15 years older than him, a divorcee, by some accounts also a widow. Apparently she had had more than three husbands. And... She proposed to Muhammad and she was his only wife. He was 25 and she was 40 when he married her. And she was his only wife until she died when she was 60, I think it was. So I think the reason that our clerics do not bring Khadija up is because clearly this was a woman who fully was empowered and was the, was the, the, the best symbol of consent and agency. Because one of the ideas that I also want to talk about when we talk about revolution is consent and agency. So when our clerics look at a woman like Khadija, who was the boss of the man who became the prophet of Islam and who was older than him, for them, she represents the worst kind of thing that a woman is. This is a woman who is in control of her life. This is a woman who, who was the boss of the founder of, of Islam and was clearly not a woman who was going to be molded in any way by Muhammad. But they focus, they obsess over Aisha. And there, there is, there's a huge fight over how old she was. Some people say she was six, some say she was nine, some say she was 19. I say in 2015, it doesn't matter how old she was. Because in 2015, marrying a child anywhere in the world is pedophilia and should be against the law. But, but this is a real issue of, of life and death in countries like Yemen, Saudi Arabia, my country, Egypt, Sudan, where women's rights activists who very courageously try to put a limit to how young a girl can be when she gets married, they're fought with charges of blasphemy by clerics who hold on to this idea of Aisha. And what they do is they say, you are breaking the, the sunnah, the tradition of the prophet, 
by questioning this. But they never say it's sunnah to marry an older woman. And, and, and I joke about this, but it, it's really not a joke. We have huge levels of male unemployment in the Middle East and North Africa, and in many parts of the, of the so-called Muslim world. I've never seen a cleric say, practice the sunnah of the Prophet, marry a woman who's older, because if you're unemployed, she can take care of you. <laughs> I never hear this. What I do hear is these men being silent when these young girls are dying in childbirth at the age of eight or nine because they have essentially been raped on their wedding night by men five, year, five times their age. This is a crime under anybody's imagination. Now, we can have arguments about how many cultures in the year 620 allow child marriage. But again, it's besides the point. What happened in the seventh century should not be something that we have to abide by in the 21st century. You know, you mentioned this phrase in the book that really stuck with me, the misogyny of the state and the misogyny of the street. We think about violence against women in this big conflict settings during revolutions, during conflicts, and in Daesh and these big settings. But there's this low-level misogyny. I don't want to say low-level because people are dying about it, But, you know, there's this constant misogyny, too, in the home that you've talked about. And in many cases, of course, the power is with the father in the household. So how do we engage men more? Because the reality is right now in the home, in the state and the street, a lot of men in these regions still have that defining role. How can men play more of a role in this revolution? One of the points that I try to make in my book is that it's really important to see my book not, not as something that just indicts men from my part of the world and to somehow make it out to be that all Arab or all Muslim men have this structure in their DNA that makes them especially misogynist. I think it's, it's this trifecta that, that I'm trying to unpack here that encourages it because it, it, it institutionalizes it on many levels. But I, but I make comparisons to what happens here in the, in the US. And I often say that in the Middle East and North Africa, I fight the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Here in the US, I fight what I call the Christian Brotherhood. And these are the, the right-wing Christian groups who have been instrumental in, in, in fighting against women's reproductive rights. These are the kind of right-wing political groups that have led to something like the case of Purvi Patel, the Hindu woman in Indiana who was recently sent to jail for 20 years under charges of feticide. Now, this, this is unheard of. Uh, the, the, the entire world sat back and thought, what is going on in the United States? That this woman who said that she had a miscarriage was sent to jail on charges of feticide. Basically, a woman is considered an incubator in, in some of these states. And there are some states also in the South where women have very little access to either contraception or um, reproductive rights generally, especially abortions. So I draw the line between what I call purity culture here in the United States, this obsession with virginity, this obsession with women's bodies, this obsession with vaginas, and I, and I, I connect it to the obsession with modesty. In modesty cultures where I come from, again an obsession with vagina, and, and this, this saying now that I want to put on all t-shirts across the world is, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. Because these, <laughs> these very religious conservative men are obsessed with our vaginas. So purity culture here and modesty, modesty, modesty culture over there have to be connected so that you don't think that I'm just talking about the men of my part of the world. Misogyny exists on a spectrum globally, but each country has made its own progress along that spectrum thanks to the, the, the effort of feminists and thanks to its ability to break that trifecta of the state, the street and the home. So going back to my region now and what's going on in the home, I think it's very important to realize that because of that trifecta, what ends up happening is the misogynies are reflected back and forth. So for example, in March of 2011, when the military in Egypt subjected women revolutionaries to so-called virginity tests, essentially sexual assaults, the military knew it could get away with this because this concept of a virginity test exists in the Egyptian home. If a family, for example, I have been told many stories about this, but one story I was, I was actually told was, someone said, my friend was engaged, she, the, the engagement broke up for whatever reason and her fiance actually contacted her parents and said, I think you should have your girl checked. And you can actually go to a forensics doctor and basically ask him to issue a virginity certificate. This exists in Turkey, this exists in parts of Iraq, this exists in Egypt. This is outrageous, this is a crime against the body of a, a girl or a woman. And I connect that crime, again it's under this idea of consent and agency to one of the earliest crimes that happens in the home again. Now, this virginity test that was perpetrated by the state, the state knew that the people on the street and in the home would, would not be outraged. When, when I heard about these virginity tests, I thought, for sure we're going to have another revolution now. How could they violate our revolutionaries like this? Nothing happened. The women who exposed these tests, they were called liars. And they were told that you were trying to malign our honorable military that is trying to protect us against Mubarak. 
The state knew the home would be quiet. Just as the home knows the state will be quiet when the home perpetrates one of the earliest crimes against the body of the girl, and that is in the form of genital mutilation or cutting. So the misogynies are con constantly reflected back. And that is all underpinned by the legislation that allows this to happen and that allows street sexual harassment to go unpunished and, and unaccountable. You know, there's a spectrum of actors you highlight from the, the feminists, the ideologues, the civil society actors to governments to international organizations. What range of actions do you think is the best way to actually address it now? Because much as I think we need to raise, you know, awareness about the problems, I'd also love a chance to think about what the solution is and how we can move forward. Right. Well, I think the solutions belong on many levels. Kind of the ultimate solution, I'm not a policymaker, but my quickest answer to what can we do is destroy the patriarchy. How can we destroy the patriarchy takes many levels. And I think when I, whenever I'm asked at gatherings like this, what can I do to help you and women from your background, I say nothing. You as individuals can do nothing because only we can help ourselves. So I say, you know, fight the misogyny in your country. Because believe me, when the Muslim Brotherhood or the state or anybody in my country finds out about a case like Pervy Patel, or finds out that women in, in, the, in the US don't get equal pay or you haven't had a woman president yet, the first thing they say to me is, don't you know they beat women up in America as well? Don't you know that, that, that rape happens every four minutes in America as well? So their excuse is always that there's misogyny over there. Of course there is, there's misogyny everywhere. So I say, fight the misogyny in your own community because that lifts up feminism on a global level. On a political level, ask your politicians why they are silent when they buy billions of dollars worth of oil from Saudi Arabia, sell Saudi Arabia billion, billions of dollars worth of weapons, and they know what Saudi Arabia does to women. The Swedish foreign minister tried to say something about this, and she was banned from speaking at the Arab League. But worse, in Sweden, this paragon of feminism, she was attacked by the business community because they didn't want to lose money. She was attacked by politicians for being too emotional too emotional. This is the Swedish foreign minister. And you know, again, misogyny has not been erased anywhere. So on a, on a political level, ask your politicians why they're shamefully silent and they basically throw women away like cheap currency and bargaining chips when they sit, sit with our regimes. Now, again, I'm not saying in the way that Laura Bush did when she took over the presidential address just before this country invaded Afghanistan. We are invading Afghanistan to liberate the women from their burqas, which was just ludicrous. This is not why this country invaded Afghanistan. So I'm not asking for anyone to invade because most Western countries have terrible records when it comes to colonialism and imperialism in my part of the world and hypocrisy when it comes to using women's issues. So don't come invading us for our sake but talk to your politicians about why they are hypocritical when it comes to women's issues and when, when, why they are so easily able to strike these deals. Is it possible to be a femi feminist and actually practice Islam? Okay. Um, that is a good question that is going to require somewhat of a complex answer. I used to call myself a Muslim feminist, I no longer do. I, I call myself a Muslim and a feminist, and my, my Islam and my feminism are in, on separate parts of my being. But I belong to a movement called Musawa, which, and Musawa is the Arabic word for e uh, equality. It's a movement, a global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. It was launched in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia in 2009. And, and that movement brings together scholars of Islam, activists, writers like myself, and others who identify with the goals of Musawa. Now, among Musawa's members is a woman who is a personal hero of mine and a, and a mentor, an African-American scholar of Islam called Amina Wadud. Amina Wadud identifies as an Islamic feminist. So I'm a Muslim and a feminist. She says I'm an Islamic feminist. Amina, in 2005, March of 2005, in the city, New York, where I used to live at the time, led us in the, in the first public Friday prayer. She was the imam in the first mixed, and it was a mixed gender Friday prayer. It was men and women praying side by side. Some of us. I think I was one of two women who didn't wear a headscarf and I had my period. So I broke all kinds of laws. But, but I, I took part in this prayer as a Muslim and as a feminist. Amina led us in this prayer as a, a woman imam, as an Islamic feminist. Amina believes you can be a Muslim and a feminist because she reinterprets the religion. She has studied at Al-Azhar, which is where all the clerics of the world, of the Sunni world, go and study, so where they can then go and, and spread the message of Sunni Islam. Amina believes that you can be a, uh, an Islamic feminist. 
The reason I don't call myself a Muslim feminist, but I do believe you can be a Muslim and a feminist, but I wanted to complicate the answer for you for a bit, is because I, I don't want to engage in my verse versus your verse. I don't want to... Now, Amina produces the verses that are feminist and that say things like, the Prophet was married to Khadija, the Prophet's last sermon said, you must treat women well. Um, if there was a time where certain things, just as in the Bible or the Torah, were acceptable, now they're no longer acceptable, that kind of stuff. So it's, a, it's an active feminist reinterpretation of Islam. I'm fighting so many things, I'm so glad that there were women like Amina around. My feminism is much more of a secular kind. I say it's 2015, it's against the law. So I need a law that helps me with this, but I also understand that there, there were people before that Friday prayer who contacted us, because at the time I was a board member of the Progressive Muslim Union of North America, and we were co-sponsors of this prayer. I went to this prayer, no questions asked, but there were some people who contacted us and said, I need the religious justification for why this prayer is okay. And if I want those people along with me in this revolution, this social sexual revolution, I need Musawa and I need women like Amina Wadud, who can then give me the verse and the saying of, of the Prophet and the Sunnah of the Prophet that will then allow those who need Islam to come before their feminism to come to the prayer. And at the launch of Musawa, there were two young women that, that were very, that I found very uh, inspiring at the meeting. My roommate was a British Pakistani Muslim. And she would say to me often, if it's a competition between my Islam and my feminism, my Islam will win. But there was an Egyptian feminist who I've gotten to know much more since and who recently launched, well, before the revolution, launched an anti-street sexual harassment movement called Harassmap. This young Egyptian woman said to me, in the contest between my Islam and my feminism, my feminism will win. These are two Muslim women, one from Egypt, one from the UK of South Asian descent. Both of them at this conference, both of them members of Musawa. One of them wants a secular Islam, I mean a secular feminism, and one wants an Islamic feminism. And we have to be prepared to give both of them what they want if we want this social sexual revolution to succeed. There's a lot of uh, discussions about uh, sort of what is the essential Islam? Is it Islam uh, fundamentally conducive to terrorism? Is it conducive to mis misogyny? What's the link between women's rights and all these problems that are suffered uh, in a lot of these Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim majority countries? I don't think Islam is one thing. I think Islam is many, many things. And I, and I think one of the biggest problems that, that we keep going into again and again is like, who is the true Islam and what is the true Islam and who speaks for Islam? There, there isn't a one, one Islam that I can point to and, and tell you this is Islam. I mean, a lot of the misogyny that we see in my part of the world, the Middle East and North Africa, is a toxic mix of Islam and, or, or religion and culture. And I, and I include Christianity in many instances as well. And this is also by way of, of showing you that it's not just about Islam. Because in, in one instance, when I talk about domestic violence laws and the efforts of feminist groups on the ground to fight for legislation against domestic violence, Lebanon was a, was a, a very troublesome uh, case study because after about 10 years of fighting for domestic violence legislation, the Lebanese parliament, which was on and off during that time, so it wasn't a continuous kind of ignoring of it, when they finally sat and looked at the bill, the leaders of the Christian and Muslim community in Lebanon. Now, Lebanon is a country of about 18 or 19 sects. The Christian and Muslim leaders in Lebanon objected to language in the domestic violence bill or the anti-domestic violence bill that criminalized marital rape. So this wasn't just the imams saying that, you know, according to Islam, this was the Christian priests as well. And they, they all believed it was a man's right to have sex on demand. And because of, of these leaders of the Christian and Muslim community in Lebanon, the language against marital rape was removed and it was made even worse. A man was basically given the right to have sex on demand in Lebanon, Christian and Muslim men. So I think that the, this, this question about what is the real Islam at this stage in, in the game is incredibly naive. There are many different Islams. You know, which Islam are you talking about? The Islam in Turkey of Erdogan that has changed according to whether Turkey wants to join the EU or not. When the AKP wanted to join the EU, the, the Erdogan's party at the time, he wasn't president, but his party was working very closely with feminist groups and they basically made their first article in the constitution. They removed that the man was the head of the family and made men and women are equal because they wanted their constitution to be in line with something the EU could accept. When the EU told Turkey, you're not coming in because this is basically a Christian club, Turkey said, well, okay, you know what? This is another kind of Islam now. Now, if you talk to feminist groups in Turkey, it's a very different AKP. So, you know, which Islam is it? 
So my, my point is, it's a, it's a complicated Islam. It's, a, it's an Islam that ends up doing this very, very difficult dance with the culture that you're talking about. In Saudi Arabia, it's one dance. In Iran, it's another dance. Rouhani, you know, what kind of Islam is he practicing? Where, you know, he's, he's able to sit down and sign this, this agreement with the US, yet at the same time, he's complicit in the deaths of how many Syrians? You know, so which Islam, the Islam in Morocco, that has produced a human rights defender called Khadija Riyadi, who wants to decriminalize sex outside of marriage. This is a Muslim woman saying that anyone should be able to have sex outside of marriage. In Saudi Arabia, a rape victim is sentenced to be flogged unless she gets a royal pardon. So see, this, this is by way of saying again, there is no one Islam. There is no true Islam. Islam is what we make it. And often, all those things that you said, the, the economy, the politics, the history of the country, ends up making a different kind of Islam according to where you're talking. So for me, it, 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 it is something that I have a right to enter into that arena where they're doing that dance and wrestle it away and say that belongs to me as well. And that's why I joined Musawa. And essentially, honestly, at the end of the day, all religion, as far as I'm concerned, has a, a, a deeply troublesome misogynist heart. All religions, very few. I mean, my Wiccan friends will raise a hand and say, not Wiccans. Okay, so maybe I will leave Wiccans to the, to the side, okay? But you know, Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Muslims, Christians, you name it. And I think that there is th that troublesome misogyny at the heart essentially is about controlling women's sexuality. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.